we are live hello all welcome a very warm welcome from india to all the international delegates and our own philip colleagues today we are we are here for the aios the international ophthalmic conclave 2024 with the best of the minds from the world society of the pediatric ophthalmology establishment session the topic being childhood myopia a new paradigm at this i welcome the chairperson dr pradeep sharma the moderator dr ramesh kekunia to take over the session thank you thank you dr subhav welcome to all the delegates from all over the world on this aios wspos childhood myopia a new paradigm webinar and i think we are now having the after effects of covid which has been dying but the pandemic that it has uh, propagated the myopia pandemic we are still have to deal with uh, fortunately we have had a, a good work done by several people and it has shown to control myopia or halt the myopia progression to some extent and we are going to have some of these interesting talks we are all learning and uh, in this seminar i think we'll have the update from various people on how to control this uh, new pandemic of myopia which is uh, threatening to be taking over the whole world 50% of the population by 2050 so let's uh, get on to it and we have very interesting speakers very interesting talks and we will learn a lot all together so i hand it over to uh, ramesh to carry on the introduction of the speakers and the rest of the i hope i am audible uh, welcome everyone good morning good afternoon good evening and good night to all the people who have joined to uh, this first webinar of season 5 this time it's a collaborative webinar with all india ophthalmology societies international ophthalmic conclave webinar this is our first webinar on uh, season 5 as usual we have a uh, global speakers and experts i am joined by uh, as a chairman of this uh, session by uh, dr pradeep sharma who is the ex professor aims and uh, currently he is the director of strabismus and pediatric and neuro ophthalmology services at center for sight new delhi we will be joined soon by uh, dr andres grobolski Uh, who is a professor of ophthalmology university of wamia mazuri poland and he is also head of the institute of research in ophthalmology in poland and he is the current president of ever ever is a european vision and i research association and he is also a treasurer of european academy of uh, ophthalmology we have another expert panelist from india dr jyoti matalia she is the head and senior consultant uh, in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus and neuro ophthalmology in narayan netralaya bangalore we have also joined by uh, my friend uh, dr kennischel he is a division chief of pediatric ophthalmology strabismus and adult mortality and professor of ophthalmology at upmc Pittsburgh. Uh, he is also director of international business ophthalmology and director of pediatric ophthalmology program development at uh, UPMC Eye Center. We are also joined by Dr. Ch Sandra Chandramoli. She is the head of Myopia Clinic and also senior consultant in the Department of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus at Arvind Hospital, Coimbatore. Uh, welcome, everyone. as far as the speakers we have uh, dr rohit saxena from rp center aims uh, new delhi and uh, look audrey chia she is the head of pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus service and also she is the clinical director of myopia service and she has done a lot of uh, work in the field of myopia she is from snec singapore uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Padmaja Sankri Dok. It's very, very late at night. She's she was very gracious enough to join us today, and she is the head of Global Myopia Management, Zeiss Vision Care, 
She is also a conjoined professor of, uh, at School of Optometry and Vision Science at UNSFD, uh, UNSW Australia. Last but not the least, uh, we are also joined by Dr. Pavan Vorkichela. He is a scientist uh, of Myopia Research Lab at Ali Prasada Institute. And he is also head and consultant optometrist in Infer Myopia Center at uh, Ali Prasad Eye Institute, India. A warm welcome to all of you. Uh, now I'd like to invite Dr. Rohit Saxena to deliver his uh, first lecture on epidemiology of myopia. Over to you, Rohit. Thank you, Ramesh, uh, for the opportunity and WSPOS and AIOS. I'll be speaking on epidemiology of uh, myopia in India. Uh, so uh, just a word about the importance why we are discussing it. Uh, in sheer economic or financial terms, uh, the economic burden is about 250 billion per annum. Myopia is supposed to result in a productivity loss of about $250 billion a year. Asia being the most affected and uh, essentially just talking about India, the estimates of prevalence of uncorrected refractive error and the cost of spectacle provision would be about 6.3 billion Indian rupees or about 130 million US dollars to almost 20, uh, uh, 513 or almost 520 million dollars if we have to treat the Indian population with ready-made or uh, custom spectacles. So essentially the cost itself is something that we should be very worried about. Other than that, the problems with myopia are that it is difficult to detect. So you need to screen children. Uh, overall, it retards the learning ability. It uh, makes it difficult for them to learn. They perform poorly, therefore loss of ec uh, economic uh, employment economic loss and impaired quality of life. And of course, we know about the pathological myopia resulting in uh, uncorrected vision loss or unmanageable vision loss in older age group. This is, of course, uh, the paper that really uh, made the world sit up and take notice. This was the Brian Holden paper in 2016, which talked about or projected that almost 50% of the world's population will become myopic and 10% with high myopia with its adjacent or associated related problems. So uh, it really made the world sit up and take notice. The, uh, the only thing was that almost uh, a sixth or more of the world's population was represented just by five or I think six studies from all over the country. So uh, it, I thought, slightly underrepresented India. So we'll run through some of the studies that really talked about or are able to give us an idea of how what's happening in India. It talked about the South Asian problem of almost 14% in 2000 and projected to also reach 50% of what is expected in the world right by 2050. Uh, this is again another study uh, which talked about the uh, projection and uh, the available data. So this gray line showing that about 2000-2001 Murti et al. Uh, estimated about 7.4% it rose to 13.1% in the same area in India, which we had done, and then recently 21%. So there has been a very recent, along with COVID, a rise in the prevalence of myopia. And again, uh, myopia can be very, very significant and can actually impact 5 to 10% of the GDP of India and China. So these are very, very important figures. This was the um, myopia study which we had done in the area which was evaluated just previously about a decade or so earlier by Murthy et al., who talked about 7.1% as the prevalence among children, 5 to 15 year old, and it jumped to about 13% uh, in the study that we did. The uh, higher prevalence was there in private schools compared to government schools. Uh, a unique feature in India, which is private public schools, uh, a little more affluent children, more access to digital devices, uh, more homework, longer school hours, tuition. So these are probably the factors where private schools were resulting in a higher prevalence. More in girls as compared to boys, uh, obviously prevalence was more in older children and playing two hours a day was uh, showing to be protective. So these were important factors, again, uh, coming across socioeconomic status and reading and writing for long hours 
was important as a causative agent. Uh, this study was, of course, done pre-COVID, so we expect that the prevalence would have jumped significantly. We followed up this cohort of children, and we came out with an incidence of 3.4%. Again, it doesn't look all that much when you look in percentages, why, especially when you compare it to East Asia. But when you look at the fact that almost 26 crore children exist in India between 5 to 15 years, you can imagine that 3 to 4% of them is a very, very high number. And almost 50% of the children followed up with showing progression. Again, factors were pretty similar for progression as compared to as it was for prevalence. And uh, the only thing that we all we did find outdoor activity to be moderately protective for uh, progression also, uh, which is not seen consistently all across everywhere. This was a rural part of the study that we did. So this was, these were rural children. Again, the highlight was a high, higher than expected prevalence of almost 6.4%. Uh, which was, again, very surprising because we really didn't think that rural myopia was going to be so much in school-going children. The factors were, again, similar uh, in the rural areas as it was in the urban area. This was a study from South India, uh, which was done in Tamil Nadu. And here, this was post-COVID. So you can see the very high jump in the prevalence of almost 17.5%. This was a very large study which evaluated this. So we know that myopia has probably jumped significantly post-COVID. In fact, we see that as an attitudinal change among all the, all the parents. The prevalence of myopia, this was a meta-analysis that we did over the last four decades because there were no good large studies. So we accumulated all the data over, available over the last four decades. So evaluating almost 1. Uh, 166,000 urban children and 120 rural children in the 5 to 15 age group, and the overall prevalence came to 7.5% with the uh, 11 to 15 year urban children showing almost 15% in the last decade. And again, remember, this was pre-COVID. This also showed that, uh, as we had seen in the rural study, that there has been a recent jump in the last decade in the rural myopia, possibly related to the increased prevalence of the internet and digital devices. Uh, this was by Pavan and, uh, and his team where they again they predicted based on the available data of the myopia in India, and they also came to very close to 50%. So we know that we are actually going to hit what is the ominous 50% uh, mentioned in the Brian Holden group. So uh, it's very, very important that we take and look at preventive strategies. We need to look at not only primary prevention, but secondary prevention. And I'll just run through some of the important things in India that we are doing and we hope to be able to achieve. So the, the most important thing is behavioral modifications in India, where we are looking to increase outdoor time and decrease near time. For secondary prevention, it's important to identify. There exists a school screening program, so identify and document children. Detailed examination of these children provide spectacles in the school, make parents and teachers aware, and then, of course, store this data so that we can follow up and identify. This is the school screening program that was started in 1994 uh, which was very early. They were supposed to screen all the school children. Uh, effectively, not clear, but possibly four yearly. Six, nine was the cutoff. And then they were to be referred to the optometrist with providing spectacles uh, locally in the school. Unfortunately, it suffers from lack of data available on the children's screen, refracted. And therefore, we are not able to get the all, all over India the exact prevalence and progression data available. So our aim is to manage this by not only increasing awareness, but involving the education ministry, so that which has been done in Singapore, China, everywhere, the education department is the key uh, which runs these programs so that we can identify children who are myopic and progressors. So the aim is to have a national survey policy change, which would include capacity building and providing refractive error to children, strengthen the school eye screening program so that we can collect this data and get nationwide data about the prevalence and progression. And of course, the key changes that have made an impact both in, uh, in East Asia, particularly Taiwan, which has really worked towards changing the environment the child is in. So make school level changes, make uh, outdoor activity compulsory, modify classroom designs to have more light in, ensure and insist on environmental and lifestyle modifications so that we can increase awareness at the school among the children, teachers, and everybody involved with the children. So uh, this is like one of the pamphlets that we have tried to distribute in school about myopia 
and ensure that these children are aware about the problems and the long term changes so essentially myopia is an emerging public health problem worldwide particularly in india also and the prevalence is effect is expected to affect almost 50% of the world's population uh, india it's definitely showing a great uh, increasing trend and considering the population of india it's very very important that these large numbers should be controlled uh, there is it is required to have a multi pronged strat strategy to manage these children of myopia thank you very much for the opportunity and the attention thank you very much uh, uh, rohit for that lucid talk and also talking on epidemiology and the preventive strategy uh, next up is uh, dr padmaja shankari dog she is going to talk about uh, when to use contact lens uh, for myopia progression so over to you padmaja i think everyone can see my slides okay um good afternoon everyone it's a pleasure to be here today and i'd like to thank aios and westpos for the invitation uh, to present at today's symposium my disclosures are listed on this slide now it is uh, well established that uh, contact lenses and not okay can uh, effectively slow the progression of myopia with respect to contact lenses soft contact lenses these are multifocal type lenses and what we have currently uh, center distance center near extended depth of focus as well as dual focus lenses um, in terms of their designs that have been uh, shown to be effective in slowing myopia one thing of note uh, when it comes to contact lenses is that uh, these are able to target uh, the stimulus at the retina much more effectively in comparison to spectacle lenses it is also well established that uh, children as young as 7 to 8 years of age can insert and remove contact lenses as well as care for their lenses quite effectively it is also well established that there is improvement with respect to quality of life when we talk about contact lenses in a study that uh, did a review of all the available literature they found that quality of life and uh, self esteem was much greater with contact lenses in comparison to spectacle lenses <clears throat> More recently, in a study that was conducted in uh, Kuala Lumpur, what they did was to look at uh, ortho K versus uh, single vision spectacle lenses, and they looked at quality of life across all domains, and it was found to be improved. now despite the fact that uh, we know that contact lenses are effective in slowing the progression of myopia it appears that we are driven by practices and perceptions with regards to attitudes that uh, parents as well as practitioners have with respect to using uh, contact lenses in myopia control practice so here's some data that came out of china recently and when we look at this data and what has happened here is uh, parents were asked as to at what age they would like to start their children in contact lenses and what you see with the gray bar is that uh, most of them uh, overwhelming majority of the parents indicated that uh, they would like to start contact lenses at 18 years of age similarly in another study that was conducted in spain and here parents were asked if they were aware of uh, myopia control strategies and as you can see with the peach colored bars uh, in fact parents seem to say that they are much more aware of uh, contact lenses in comparison to the other strategies however uh, when asked as to what they would like their child to wear again uh, overwhelming majority of them chose spectacle lenses with peripheral uh, defocus technology and this is data from a practitioner based survey that was conducted in uh, 35 plus countries and it was published in 2020 and what you see here is that uh, when you look at the contact lens fits and then you look at myopia control myopia control fits represented only approximately 2% of all the fits this figure would be slightly higher now but it again uh, speaks to the fact that very few of the contact lenses are myopia control lenses and again when we look 
look at uh, what practitioners have been doing and at the ages at which they're fitting contact lenses, you can see that although there are some children who are fitted at young um, years, many of the practitioners start fitting contact lenses in children when they're approximately 12 years or older. Those are the um, uh, gray bars. And when we look at the proportion of the fits from these 35 plus countries, we see that only in three of these countries, um, approximately 20% of the fits were for myopia control lenses. So that's uh, saying that there is very limited uptake of uh, myopia control contact lenses. And when we put this all together, it appears that the big issue here is the perception around safety of contact lenses, as well as convenience. Convenience is sort of circular, because if you think that you know a child is not able to wear their lenses and look after their lenses, it's because you're concerned about the safety. Um, and based on this, it appears that what has been happening in the field is that myopia control lenses uh, are primarily fitted to older children. And today we will talk about the fact that maybe there are other options as well in terms of what we can do with younger children and myopia control lenses. Now, I just wanted to touch upon the safety. Um, so here we've got data from the MySight study, which is a six year study. And in this particular study, when they followed the children, what they see is that there's been no adverse event and uh, incidence of uh, significant infiltrative events was less than 1%. And the common uh, adverse reaction seemed to be mostly redness of the bulbar or the limbal conjunctiva or the tarsus. Uh, a more comprehensive evaluation of all the data was undertaken. There have been seven prospective studies uh, that give us approximately 4,000 patient years. And the incidence of microbial keratitis from this uh, evaluation was uh, pegged at uh, 2.7 out of 10,000 patient years. Uh, actually, there was only one single case, and that translates to this figure, and this is no different to what we observe with adult contact lens wearers. With respect to symptomatic corneal infiltrative events, 42 out of 10,000, or less than 1%. So generally, contact lens wear in children is very similar to what you see with adult contact lens wearers in the sense that there's no increased risk, and the risk is minimal when children wear the lenses on a daily wear, daily disposable basis. Now, uh, because uh, we seem to be using contact lenses primarily for older children, the first question we've got to address is whether these lenses are indeed effective in older children. And for that, we go back to the MySight study. The study is six years in duration, and children at the start of the study were eight to 12 years of age, and the study was conducted in two parts. In the first part, they were randomized to MySight lenses. Those are the green uh, squares or single vision lenses. And at the end of three years, those wearing single vision lenses were also switched to MySight lenses. And what you see here is that um, at the end of part one, now children are 11 to um, you know, 12, so 11 to 14 years of age. They're much older, and what we see here is that there is a change in the uh, progression slope, much slower when they switched into my sight lenses. And this is considered to be indicative that uh, these lenses work in older children as well. In a more recent study uh, where they used ortho -K lenses, they divided the children into young and the older age groups. The older age groups are given in these dashed lines. And again, you can see that uh, these lenses are effective in older children. So, that, so that's uh, very well taken care of. Now, what about the young children? With the young children, there is a role uh, to fit contact lenses in fast progressors and non-responders. When we talk about non-responders, nowadays we talk mostly of uh, combination therapy where we combining um, use of commonly atropine with an optical device. Now, here's some data that uh, came out of uh, the thing with combination therapy is that uh, the evidence is conflicting. In some studies, there seems to be an effect, whereas other studies do not show an effect. And what I have is 
the two good examples of that conflict. Uh, this data is out of Israel. Uh, it's a retrospective analysis. And for over two years, they charted the progression in single vision lens wearers. That's the blue line. They also tracked uh, what, uh, they, what they did here was to look at rebound. But we will look at only the first two years. So they've got the single vision lens wearers. And then they've got the atropine group in the orange and the combination therapy, atropine plus mycite. And you can see that there is a significant difference between the control versus the test groups, but within the two test groups, uh, the, it, it was not different. Whereas in a different study where they looked at um, uh, monotherapy, so they've got atropine by itself, ortho K by itself, and then they've got a combination therapy. What they found was that the combination therapy was much more effective than the monotherapy. And generally, the study said that younger the age, uh, there is poorer efficacy. So you want to try and do the best you can in the younger children. So uh, what? Uh, so we know that, yes, it's effective in older children. There's a role for contact lenses in younger children and the fast progresses or non-responders. The thing when we uh, talk about myopia control lenses is that there is now evidence that suggests that myopia control efficacy is linked to compliance. Uh, better the compliance, better the efficacy. And what we also found in our studies was that children who are non-compliant are likely to discontinue uh, from lenses and they provide, generally they tend to provide lower ratings that's given by these uh, dark um, uh, dark circles. They, they give poorer ratings for visual quality and um, comfort uh, or they're more likely to drop out of your uh, lens wear. And in a study where they looked at uh, my sight lenses and natural view lenses, the vision was very similar between the lenses, but children tended to prefer one lens over the other. There was no particular consensus or there was no single lens type that was preferred, but generally children seemed to prefer one lens over the other. It might be to do with the pupil size or other factors. So in summary, uh, with myopia control contact lenses, we are seeing slower than expected uptake. Uh, we think the issue is around uh, safety concern, but uh, the data suggests that uh, adverse events in children are no different to that of uh, adult lens wearers. Uh, it appears that contact lenses are preferred for older children, and we do know that lenses are efficacious in older children. In younger children, there is a role for uh, contact lenses and fast progressors and non-responders in terms of uh, combination therapy. We know that compliance is linked to efficacy. Lower compliance means non-satisfied lens wearers who are likely to drop out. Therefore, uh, we ask the practitioners that they consider a lens type that suits the child, maybe try and reduce the relative positive power for a satisfactory wear experience. And with that, I'll finish. And thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Padmaja, for that nice and uh, crisp talk on contact lenses users. So we have some time for questions now. So first of all, I would like to ask the panel if you have any questions or uh, comments to make. So um, this guy, this is Ken Nishal. Some some great talks. Um, I I always um, I, I'm all, I what I I want to ask Rohit. Do you think that the interventions that we're we're discussing and that uh, Padmaja has discussed and the rest of us are going to discuss? Do you think there's any evidence right now that uh, if we intervene, we are going to stop? the pathologies that we're worried about in other words it makes sense that if you can stop axial elongation that we are we are going to reduce uh the amount of pathology but how, I, what i'm getting at is how much is the role of the 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 haplotype the genotype of the individual because you know i'm a minus five and a half and i could very well get a retinal detachment right so if you stop someone going from from being uh, minus five, uh, uh, let's say minus eight to minus five and a half, we don't have the evidence at the moment that that necessarily means you're going to reduce their risk of glaucoma or retinal detachment. 
So I agree that we need to do this. So that's what I want to hear from Padma Jaya and yourself, is with what confidence do you tell parents? Because Padma Jaya, you're right. The, the profile of risk is low, but there's still a risk, right? So with what confidence do you say to parents, if we do this, your child is not going to get the pathological complications that we, we're worried about? What's the confidence level that you can say that with? Uh, do I go first or? Uh... Yeah, go ahead. Go, yeah, go, okay. go ahead. Go. <laughs> All right. I mean, um, so so complications are one thing to consider. When we talk about the impact, we talk a little bit more than complication. We talk about the fact that um, there is direct lifetime costs associated with myopia. I'll get to complications, but when we start with the burden of myopia itself, um, the evidence is fairly clear that uh, compared to single vision lenses, if we uh, consider some of the newer type of strategies, then the burden to the person is the, or the direct lifetime costs are going to be lower. There's going to be more upfront costs because these treatments, they're just about coming into the system. They're more expensive than where they should be. But over a period of time, we think that would go down. But the modeling shows that the costs are going to be less. So, so that's a taken, uh, that's a given. The modeling also shows that the risk of complications is greater at higher levels of myopia. I get the question, can we be saying, look, you know, if we, if we control it, will an individual's risk reduce? But again, the modeling is saying, so if you, if you look at minus three versus minus five or minus six, the risk of having the complications is much greater at minus five and minus six. And therefore, the attempt is to try and keep the person at lower levels. And therefore, hopefully, we try and reduce the risk of developing those complications. So yes, uh, those are the two things that um, I would say we would have to consider when we, when we look at uh, what impact myopia has. So, uh, I would just I would just like to add just a couple of things to that one. While we can't in an individual patient predict the risk factor per uh, you know uh, at eight or at five, but we know that at eight you are a much higher risk for developing retinal problems and long term uh, issues in the retina that can cause uh, irreplaceable or irreparable visual loss. So uh, projecting the available information onto individual child, we know that. Uh, that line that says every diopter counts. So we need to ensure that every child, uh, the myopia is restricted to the minimum possible, particularly prevent them from reaching high myopia. So there the urgency of catching children earlier because we can see that there is a major rise in the uh, incidence rates at about six to eight years of age. So if a child starts becoming myopic early in his seven or eight years, then he has almost 10 years now and probably longer post COVID where we have seen even young adults having progressive myopia. So 10 years or more of progressive myopia can really get them to have very high myopia. So every diopter counts, I think should be the one. And that's what we discussed with parents. And besides the economic cost that Padmaja also talked about overall for an individual, as well as, as a country or a nation or a, or, or a race as, group of people, the costs are immense, the redu reduced productivity, myopic children have major problems in performance in school, and they probably we do not reach their optimal ability. So again, not just the direct economic cost, but also the lack of productivity cost of to a nation or, a, or to the person. So I think overall, there is a huge impact myopia is making directly and indirectly to, uh, to the nation, to the people and to an individual child per se. So these are things that we discuss when we talk to a parent about the importance of intervention and preventing, uh, you know, the ability of progressing in these children. I had uh, one question each for Rohit and uh, Padmaja. The first question for Rohit, uh, you know, your presentation and the evidence says that there is a definite difference between the rural and urban. Mm -hmm. The levels of myopia progression is different. Does this support that uh, it's more of a nurture than nature? What is your opinion? What predominates myopia progression, whether it is nature or nurture? 
So uh, I don't know how far it's right, but now I've actually started telling parents that, you know, myopia is the youngest lifestyle disease in humans. That's a line that I, you know, insist to parents that just like, you know, diabetes is lifestyle related, uh, predisposed patients, the person has to be predisposed, but the environment has a very major role to play in development of diabetes. Similarly, I think in myopia, uh, it, it's, I think the environment that is changing, there are a lot of studies that have shown one very interesting one from Singapore about Indian parents being, you know, about 13 to 14% being myopic, the immigrants, direct immigrants from India to Singapore, and their children in the next generation, it jumped to almost 26, 28%, showing that no race is not, is, uh, is bereft. And it's probably the environment that is making a major role, major change that is happening. Again, probably the rural landscape, we had a lot of outdoor classes, fortunately, or otherwise, we don't have such fixed schools in the rural area. So a lot of education happens outdoors. That probably is or was expected to be protective. But again, uh, fortunate or otherwise, we are seeing a lot of digital penetration into the rural areas, especially with the access availability of internet. So that may be responsible for that significant jump we are seeing over the last decade. So it's probably awareness about the, inter uh, the, in uh, the environmental causes that can help us to probably limit the progression. I think the COVID has already shown that with the lockdowns, there has been a jump, which is a very good case study overall. We have seen it, I mean, very palpably, there is a change with the lockdowns, the children being less outdoors and more of uh, indoor studies. That has shown a uh, I mean, palpable difference. So I think uh, there would be a definitely a real uh, thing that nurture makes a difference. Uh, the genes wouldn't have changed. Okay, one more point. This is Dr. Jyoti. I would like to make is that in the urban, we are also looking at competitive exams. Their parents were pushing in for a lot of other things which may not be so prevalent in a rural area. So these are other things which I feel can be adding for why an urban population would be having relatively more than the rural. But as he said, it may pick up eventually with internet there. People are more glued to all social media. That was eventually going to add as well. But yeah. reinforcing lifestyle, I think it will always be the key for any of our uh, counselings when it comes to myopia treatment plans i know Thank pavan you. is i know pavan is going to talk about uh, behavioral interventions but i i just wanted to sort of again it's very difficult to tease out when we talk about the lockdown um to tease out like you said uh, dr sharma it, was it the fact that children were doing more near work or was it the fact that they were doing less outdoor play oh, actually it's a confounding factor but it would be linked right. agree yeah, so uh, but, so I think that's where we have to be. You know, when when parents tell me, please tell my child that you can't look at the digital screen, I'm like, I don't. You know that. Yeah, I don't. You can't I don't do let my, that. You know, yeah, you, you can't. Be you cannot ban. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to talk to that point, I mean, uh, there's fair bit of work that's been done, and yes, you know, is it um, is it really outdoor or indoor? So there's uh, there's a little bit of uh, debate in the field at the moment what exactly it is, but we do know that um, improving time outdoors tends to help. So even when a child is doing a lot of uh, indoor based or near based work, if we can try and improve the outdoor time, it seems to help have an effect um, in trying to keep uh, some of the progression as well as onset of myopia at bay. And with respect to uh, near uh, environment, now there is a body of work that shows that education seems to play a role. I mean, it's a big statement to make, but um, uh, we did a study in collaboration with um, groups in China where, as you know, uh, children of a certain age, uh, they start school on a certain date in a year. Um, in China, it's 1st of August. So if you if you turn six on 1st of August, you start school. If not, then you have to wait until next year. So if you take children of a certain age and then you look at the cutoff uh, pre-August and post-August, you see a very clear difference in terms of uh, their refractive error. Um, there is a, the ones, so children of a given age who are older, 
who are in a higher grade at school, they have more myopic refractive error compared to the younger children. And since that uh, study has been done, there's been uh, two other studies have, have uh, looked at that as well. It's called regression discontinuity analysis. And it's quite clearly showing a pattern uh, that there's something uh, about uh, educational systems that seems to be... Uh, worsening myopia. So in some places, they talk about trying to hold the children back for a year before you send them to school, because even if you delay the uh, onset of myopia by one year, especially in younger children, you're going to get a big return on your investment. Uh, I just want to... But we, don't. I think, uh, we will we'll go ahead, because we have some more talks. Uh, I... I would like to invite uh, Dr. Ardri Chia to talk about atropine. When he, she's sharing the slide, I just wanted to ask that question to Padmaja. What is the angest you have started the uh, contact lens? And if yes, is there, are they non-responders or high-risk patients? Uh, seven years, and uh, they were part of clinical trials. So they were just uh, mild to moderate myopia because all children were point. 7.5 to minus 5 diopters. All right. Thank you. Over to you, Audrey. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. So uh, I've been tasked to talk a little bit about atropin in Singapore and how effective it. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so... So what I'm gonna sort of like I thought I'll go through was how we have our practice of treating um myopia atrophy has changed uh, over the years and how we moved from high dose to low dose a little bit of long term efficacy and safety and a, a bit about how that has driven our current protocol at the myopia center. So why atropin? And I think in, you know you're talking about 25% in India. You know we had a big jump in Singapore that went from about 30-40% right up to 80% in in children born after 1980. So suddenly there was this huge number of myopic children. And at that time, very little was known about uh, myopia and about atropin. But there were a few studies in the US and uh, people in Taiwan had been experimenting with 1% atropin with good result. So that led to the onset of the Atom 1 study. Uh, this we enrolled 400 children, and what we had was that uh, um, half the children had atropine in one eye, placebo in the other, and the other children had placebo in both eyes. And what we can see here is that atropine 1% had a very strong effect in both spherical equivalent and axial length, but when you stopped it, suddenly at two years, you had this quite large rebound. And we also knew from this study that if you looked at uh, response and poor response, there were 10% of, uh, of children that even on 1% atropin had a poor response. So that led to us using atropin 1% in our research clinic. So we were mainly targeting at that time moderate high myopia because we were worried at the time of side effect and risks and things. And children were wearing pore glasses, progressive glasses and tinted glasses. And to prevent the, the rebound, we were tapering these children to a stop. Gradually, however, we moved on to part-time atropine, the fact that maybe less atropine would be okay. And here's an example of a child that is treated with part-time 1% atropine. Just to orientate you on the y-axis here, we have the increasing myopia. X-axis is time. The crosses indicate the right eye, the circles, the left eye. And here we have dates. So this child was 8 years old in 2011. It was started on 1% atropine three times a week. You see this hyperopic shift here. Then at two years, about one, one year, almost two, we, start, we changed it to two times a week. And there was a bit of a rebound. And that stabilized. Then we went to one time a week. And then every two weeks, and then we stop here. And, and then we monitor it a bit just to make sure it didn't go up again. And, and it seemed quite okay. So... We did a, a paper on this, looking at part-time high-dose atropine, and we looked at how it went, because historically it went from three times to two times to one time, so we tried three times first. And we can use whether or not we decrease the dose or increase the dose as a proxy of whether it worked. So here, when we use three times a week, we saw that in around about sort of 30% of children, we were many, we could decrease the dose, whereas there was maybe this little 5% that we went to daily. 
when we started the children on two times a day, two times a week, we noted that there was around about this 20% that we could decrease the dose and around about 10% where we needed to increase it. And then when we started on one time, we had around about 15% that we needed to increase the dose. So, you know, what well, part-time high-dose atropine was quite effective for quite a bit of a while. At around about this time, we were also doing ATOM2 and that enrolled 400 children, which we randomized to 0.5, 0.1, and 0.01%. And this is the graph superimposed on the ATOM1, 1%, as well as the placebo. And what we could see was there was a dose-related response of all the doses and uh, that the higher dose were more effective than the lower doses. Um, but the, even the 0.01% did quite well. When we stopped it, however, we saw this rebound, which was also like a reverse curve. The higher doses rebounded more than the lower doses. And we also knew that younger children had a higher rebound and those that were still progressing in the previous year also rebounded more. In the ATOM2 study, those that progressed more than 0.5 diopters were restarted on 0.01%. And this involved 68% in the 0.5, 59% in the 0.1, and 24% in the 0.01. And children, both treated and untreated, were followed for another two years. So at around about the five-year mark in the 0.01, it seemed to be half of placebo. But in those that were at a larger rebound, 0.01 just wasn't strong enough, which also led us to know that if you had rebounded on a high dose, you probably have to go back to high dose to try and control those children. So we started using a low, do low dose atropine 0.01% from 2014. And here's a graph of a child that was started at eight years old in 2015 on 0.01. Still a little bit of progression, and then it started to stabilize. Uh, one eye did pretty well, and the other eye continued to increase, and that was reflected also in the axial length changes. Then about 12 years old, we started to taper. So we went to six times a week, then if that was, and then we went to five times a week. So every three months, I dropped one drop. And then we're, we're still, I think at this stage, it might have stopped already, but this graph ends in 2022. So there was a start, monitoring, tweak if necessary, taper, and then stop. Uh, however, we also know that some children, 0.01 is not enough. So here was a five-year-old child that was started in 2014, still progressing like just as was before. And then at that time, we didn't have any other doses. So we went back to high dose, 1% atropine two times a week, continued that for two years, cut it down to 1%, continued that for another long period. And then every 10 days, every two weeks, and we stopped it over here. So this child was actually on atropine for eight years. But this also reflects that we know younger children progress a lot faster. And from both the ATOM study and the LEM study, we know that younger children need higher doses. Um, we started introducing other doses, um, uh, 0.125 first. And this is an example of a child that started on 0.01 at 6, still progressing, tried it twice a day, still progressing over COVID. We turned after COVID with a big shock. So the parents were keen to try OK lenses a bit, but she had a lot, a lot of trouble with it and couldn't put it on properly and just wasted time. In the end, we just opted for 0.125 and that seemed to stabilize her. Uh, recently, we also now have 0.025 and these are some examples. Is a child that was started at eight years old um, and it did pretty well here, although the Experical equivalent was increasing. The axial length was actually quite, quite stable. So we just maintained it uh, and it seemed to come back down a little bit again. Um, here was a younger child, age four years old, started around about here. And you can see uh, did well, but still got some progression of the axial length. So we increased the dose to 0 0.025 uh, twice a day. Um, recently, we published a result on the likes of atropine. This is the ATLAS study. Uh, this involved the recall of 71 children from ATOM1 and 158 children from ATOM2 and we're looking at efficacy and also complications. In terms of efficacy, uh, we know already from the ATOM1-2 study that there was this rebound so that the 1% at the end of here was almost catching up with the placebo and here with the 0 0.05 and 0 0.01 uh, it was very very as well.
We also knew in terms of safety that if we stopped it uh, at, at the end of washout, that the pupil size and accommodation returned to normal uh, or to what was age appropriate. And there was no difference in full field ERG, multifocal ERG, and IOP between uh, the groups and placebo, and also no effect on extremism. So what did we find? We found uh, and an we found that the mean spherical equivalent and axial length in the first five years were similar in this ATLAS group compared to the ATOM study. So you can see in spherical equivalent, there was age related, uh, there was a dose related um, uh, effect of the, uh, of the atropine, and then you get a reverse rebound. This was the uh, old point, uh, this was the ATOM 2 study at five years. So you can see there was a bit of increase here, and this was at uh, recall. So there's still a little bit of a difference between the 0.01 dose and that's this regime, but it was not significantly significant. And this suggests that we could not stop atropine abruptly, especially the high doses, and which maybe justifies our, our management of tapering and continuing to the mid-teens. Uh, in, term, uh, in terms of the axial length, we also see a similar effect. Although there were some weird changes in the atom one, uh, where uh, you can see this, this uh, uh, placebo and 1% um, actually being a little bit different, but we did use different measures to compare uh, axial length in atom one and atom two, uh, and also the populations were a bit different. In terms of complication, when we looked at all the different sorts of possibility, and this obviously are children that are not very old, they're 20, 30 years old, uh, adults, uh, but we did not see any increase in complications, especially in terms of cataract and glaucoma uh, compared to uh, the groups. And the changes that are in terms of uh, myopic changes were mainly related to uh, the axial length and spherical equivalent rather than to the dose use. So this is our current protocol. We have uh, we take a history mainly to assess the risk profile. Uh, younger children, rapid progression, you know, high baseline marble or high risk factors. We do examination to make sure there are not other causes of myopia. And then usually we divide them into the high risk ones with the younger children, the rapid professors, and the older children with the low myopia and the low, uh, slower progressors. And then these are high risk and moderate risk. So in the younger children, we now, our protocol is use a higher low dose atropine. If you don't have that, part time high dose atropine or combo from a start if they're really fast progressors. In the uh, older group, we can use anything. We got all sorts of different options low dose atropine. Uh, myopia control glasses and contact lenses, depending on parents' uh, um, preference. If they're still progressing, we increase the dose of atropine, either in terms of percentage or in frequency, or we can add a combo or consider alternative. And when to stop, if it's on atropine monotherapy, uh, in Singapore, we normally stop when they're around about 12 um, years old, and then we continue, usually stop by around about 14, 15. If they're in a combo and they're very stable, even the younger, I try to taper atropine very slowly, and if they're stable, I stop that and continue on the optical agent if the parents are happy. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Andrews uh, could not join because uh, he informed me that there is some personal emergency. I hope everything goes well. Uh, in that case, uh, I will invite uh, Dr. Pawan to talk. And Dr. Ken Nischel has uh, graciously accepted to talk on the optical part. So he will talk after Pawan. So over to you, Pawan. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Now, Pramesh, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yeah. Well? Okay. All good. All good. Great. Thank you so much. I will be taking through the innovations in myopia care, and especially the emphasis will be on the impact myopia management guidelines. I want to start by indicating that if you go and search for myopia in PubMed, you're going to see about 30,000 plus publication and it ranges all the way from 1800 to 2024. And uh, to zoom into 2020 and later, you're going to see about 22,000. 
And just in the last year, 2023, we have 2,000 plus publications. And therefore, it's important that we are updated, otherwise we will not be seen on the map. And the agenda was straightforward for all of us, a bit optometrists or the ophthalmologists. We know that the eyeball is growing and all we want to do is stop it from the back if possible so that there is no more ocular elongation. Given that the myopia is multifactorial in nature, there are multiple solutions out there. And I've just listed down here, uh, ranging all the way from the lifestyle modifications to the optical strategies to the pharmacological management. And uh, more recently, we are also having latest tablet formulations as well. In the optical strategies, we do have options in the form of bifocal progressive addition lenses. We have options in the form of peripheral defocus lenses. In contact lens, we have daytime wear and the nighttime wear orthokeratology. And obviously, the famous low-dose atropine, what Dr. Rodrici has just taken us through. On the right side, you see that there is efficacy. There is evidence to say that these treatment strategies do work in controlling myopia progression. And this is from the network meta-analysis that we published last year. And this is the uh, more re most recent update from WSPOS on uh, what works in myopia control. And this is the most recent version published in the year 2023, indicating that you know various myopia control strategies actually work. And uh, these treatment strategies can be considered. Now also highlighted, indicating that although there remains gap in knowledge about mechanism of action and long-term outcomes, I think the, there are a lot more benefits than the risk. So or, or outweighs the risk. Two things are coming out. Number one, yes, there is evidence for all the myopia control strategies who say that it works. We do not know what's the mechanism of action and we do not know what are the long-term effects. To name a few in the... Uh, optical myopia control strategies. Uh, it starts with the myovision all the way from 2010. And we have myocare from Zeiss, Telest, uh, from Essilor, Myosmart, Myofafe. I think a lot of myo versions these days that are available in various countries. In contact lens, apart from the uh, orthokeratology, we have uh, extended depth of focus contact lenses and the widely used MySight as well. Apart from atropine, I thought I will just highlight this here, indicating that apart from atropine, we're going to have maybe the tablet formulation uh, available for us in different countries sometime soon. It's the metabolite of caffeine as a 7 methyl xanthine, with the evidence indicating that 7MX shows promise as a non toxics and uh, no side effect or side effects free oral tablet for uh, myopia control. So zooming on to the environment and the myopia, you know, there was a debate about is it really light time outdoor or is it the near work? Uh, both put together, I think uh, the multiple hypothesis revolves around why time outdoors is good. To name a few, yes, the time outdoor means there is more light in outdoor environment. Number one, we're talking about high ambient light levels. Uh, if you are in outdoor environment, obviously the child is not expected to read, which means accommodation is relaxed. And if I'm in indoor environment, there is laptop, there is a mobile phone, there is a, a card holder, too many things around. And there is a diaptric field is very different in the center and in the periphery. Again, if I'm in outdoor open play area, expectation is that you're in a playground, then there is uniform diaptric field. Other factors are dopamine release, Dopamine release is known to inhibit eyeball from growing. And there is also hypothesis related to is it really light or the specific wavelength of the spectrum that's dominating. Uh, so uh, largely, I think we still have to discuss uh, both in combination light and near work. Clearly, the life has become more indoor centric. Uh, Dr. Sharma has already indicated about how COVID has made everybody to glue to these screens. But I want to highlight, I've written that uh, screens alone cannot be blamed. You know, screens came into existence after 2006, 2008, 
But if you look at the myopia prevalence in Taiwan or in Singapore or in China, I think it already peaked in 1990s when there is no smartphone in hand. So clearly, I think apart from smartphone, reading, the closer working distance, the light levels indoors all might come into the picture. Uh, this is one of the strategies that's been employed to control the child going closer. And this is a real image from Wuhan. Uh, and in other uh, places, they're also looking at the glass classrooms so that their rooms are well lit and it helps in myopia control. Uh, apart from the uh, regular classrooms, uh, much like the pedometers that detect the number of steps convert to the calories, uh, we are also looking at development of various uh, light trackers that can map the amount of time that the child is in outdoor or in indoor environment. We developed and called it as MyLight. Uh, but before us, there are a lot of eye trackers that are uh, made available uh, from various universities and institutes. There's also notion that the uh, reading in dim light can also trigger for myopia. There are a couple of publications that I'm quoting here, one from India and one from Australia, both indicating how dim light is dangerous or reading in dim light can trigger for myopia development or myopia progression. More recently, there's a lot of uh, publications coming out in favor of repeated low level of red light therapy for myopia control. And this is the device from eye rising. Uh, it's almost like a laser focused beam. Uh, if you go in for three minutes and uh, seems like there is fantastic efficacy as you see on the screen. Of course, there are a lot of debates about the safety issues, but this has already been available in multiple countries. And the other side, people are also looking at violet light transmitting uh, spectacles. One side we are looking at, okay, is this the long wavelength. Other side, there is also evidence coming out in favor of the short wavelength light. And we investigated uh, uh, exposing humans to different wavelengths of light. As you see on the screen, 455 nanometers for blue and about 620 nanometers for the red. And we found that both the red and the green wavelength have, uh, or the long and the middle wavelength have led to ocular elongation, whereas the blue did not uh, do that, or blue inhibited the eyeball from growing. And we're also looking at wearable light therapies. Again, uh, like the WSPOA statement itself, we do not know what's the mechanism. We are still evolving, and only time will tell us what wavelength is good or is there a beneficial effect of different wavelengths of light? Uh, seems like uh, oh, there is need for simplicity when we talk about myopia practice. Everybody says, all right, we know myopia control treatment strategies are available, but we do not know who is at risk for myopia progression. Whom do I really prescribe the uh, myopia control strategies? To make life simpler, I think there are recent advancements in the field uh, are in growth curves. Much like if you go to a pediatrician, you see the growth curve of a child. In the same way, we have multiple growth curves getting incorporated into the biometers to indicate if this actual length is actually within normal limits or not. And again, multiple applications have come into the picture. This is a pre predicting myopia onset and progression. And at LVPI, we developed uh, Mission Myopia. Uh, it's a calculator. If you give in few variables, uh, it will tell if the child is at risk for myopia progression or not. Again, this is already published in scientific reports in 2020. And more recently, we made this available for the public. Uh, so now the talking about the philosophy of management itself, let's say if I bring in a case of five and up adapter, uh, for a child who is nine year old, and if I also indicate the present glass prescription that's one year old is 4.5, you know, if I give only this information, we think, all right, this is 5.5 uh, and one, uh, one day after change in progression, we want to put them on myopia control strategy. But what if I told you that the cornea is 49 adapters and actual length is 22? Right, you know, I think the myopia management, uh, when we talk about it, we're talking about the things in actual in nature. 
which is why uh, it's important as a first step, we eliminate all the refractive cases of myopia. Identify a child or any individual with axial myopia, map possible risk factor just because there is myopia does not mean we should prescribe something left, right, and center. Uh, pick a progressive myopia. If there is no myopia progression, there is no need for us to be treating aggressively. Uh, given that myopia control strategies are available, we need to pick a strategy wisely. Uh, what suits that child, the cause, the mechanism, everything need to be thought through. I think myopia management also requires a detailed counseling. And when one treatment does not work, I think it's time for us to combine and monitor uh, regularly to ensure the act on time. Uh, people also ask about when do I stop? I think the, uh, the notion again is uh, the refractive surgeons consider doing refractive surgery when the child is late teenager or, or after 19, 20 years of age because the eyeball is stable. Same thing needs to be considered here as well. Uh, late teenage, no change in refractive error or actual length. I think that's the best bet for us. To summarize, I think myopia management is beyond uh, mere prescription of single vision, especially in case of myopia progression. Multiple innovations uh, took place in the last decade. We now have options in various format. Uh, if you are not aware of where to start, if you remember IMPACT impact, I think, you know, eliminate by elimination round, you will be able to do justice to the child with myopia progression. I want to end by indicating that I think each case is very different. One size does not fit all, especially in myopia management, and thus it uh, caters or requires the personalized myopia management. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Pawan, for that uh, nice and very useful information on the innovations and also impact guidelines. Uh, I would like to really thank uh, Dr. Nischel. At the beginning of the session, I requested him because Dr. Andres could not join and he is ready with the presentation on spectacle lens intervention. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nischel, for this. Over to you. No, it's, it's my pleasure, but I don't recommend trying to put your talk together while uh, uh, the webinar is going on. So I, I hope uh, you will um, bear with me if there are any typos. So look, I'm, I'm, I'm really honored to be uh, part of this uh, really amazing group. And I want to share some uh, ideas uh, that I've sort of gleaned from the literature and from my experience. These are my disclosures. Actually, one of them is pertinent. Uh, my uh, hospital site is a SLO-sponsored clinical trial in the USA for their HAL lenses. So I'm just saying that up front, but you'll see that um, my uh, discussion is, uh, uh, I would like to think, pretty unbiased. Okay, so um, Bhavan has already mentioned the myopia consensus statement from WSPOS. This is the QR code. If you'd like to take a snapshot of that, and it'll take you straight to the um, uh, to the the consensus statement. Um, but we have one version that's also for parents, and I think this is really important, right? Because when we start to talk to parents, we the paradigms we're talking about are changing, and they they've been brought up, and now they've got their kids to look after, and we're telling them things that they perhaps had heard but didn't believe. And what I mean by that is um, uh, uh, some of the things that we're talking about now, my mother used to tell me, and I'm going to talk about that. So we've covered the burden. We've covered the interventions that perhaps we haven't covered the interventions that don't work. You know, undercorrecting the myopic prescription does not work, right? Blue light blocking glasses don't work. Bifocal glasses don't work. Um, and so what the question is, is what does work? Well, we talked about behavioral interventions, optical treatments. I'm going to talk about spectacles. We talk about, and we've talked about pharmacological. So the conclusions, you know, there's sufficient evidence that, th that we should be doing something. And, and, you know, Rohit earlier and Padmaja articulate that very well. So this is what my mother used to say, right? She says, don't read too much. Your eyes will get weak. Don't wear your glasses all the time. Your eyes will get weak and go play outside. Your eyes will get stronger. She used to say that to me and I ignored her. Well, the magic and the science of understanding really uh, comes down to emetropization. Emetropization is that 
vision dependent, light dependent phenomenon that tries to make the eye grow to a genetically and environmentally modified zero. Now, what I mean by that is it makes sense that if you're reading all the time, then why exert all that effort? Let's become nearsighted, right? That that's the that's the beauty of our bodies trying to adapt as we grow. I think we've already seen, don't read too much, your eyes will get weak. My mother was right. Don't go play outside, your eyes will get strong. My mother was right. So what about this? Don't wear your glasses all the time, your eyes will get weak. Where does that come from? Well, let's have a look. These are experiments that were done in the 1970s and 80s where um, they placed lenses in front of binocularly lens-reared monkeys. And you, look what happens. If you give them a plus nine, they all end up hyperopic. You give them a minus six, they all end up at minus six. So what's going on? The mere, the mere action of putting glasses in front of um, a non-primate, a non-human primate, makes that eye develop into the refractive error that you put in front of it. So what I'm saying is the monkeys had no refractive error. You put a plus nine on, reared them in the plus nines, they become close to plus nine. Put a minus six, they become close to minus six. So what is going on? Well, the first theory that came along is this theory of hyperopic defocus. If you put a concave lens, which is what the myopic prescription is, in front of an eye, then while in the center you have perfect focus, and that's what we're worried about, in the periphery you get a hyperopic defocus. And the idea is that in a growing eye, the eye thinks, oh, oh, oh I blurred, I blurred, I've got to grow to catch that light, right? So the longer the eyeball becomes, the more nearsighted you become. So the the peripheral hyperopic defocus was thought to be the problem. When you put a convex lens in front of the eye, um, you now create a myopic defocus in the periphery, which is the red lay rays. And now the eye stops growing because it's saying, wait a minute, stop growing so that you can catch up with the light focus that is in front of the retina. It's a, it's a very important concept. So there's hyperopic defocus, which is one theory, but more recently, there is simultaneous myopic retinal defocus theory. Think of this, and I want to just say that a lot of what I've taken here, because I've done it quickly, has been taken from um, myopiaprofile.com. It's a really great website um, uh, if you want more information. So I'm, I just want to say that this is uh, a lot of what I'm going to show you now is taken from that website. Think of this as two planes of focus, one being on the retina to correct the myopia and the other in front of the retina for myopic defocus, which could be anywhere across the retina, not just in the periphery. So it's really similar to uh, peripheral hyper, uh, hyperopic defocus. But what we're thinking about now is how can we do simultaneous myopic retinal defocus so that we try and stop eyes from growing? Well, this is a really nice paper. And if you have a chance, it's open access. Earl Smith III, his work, if you look at basic science of myopia and his work on animal models, non-human primate models, is phenomenal. And what he did here in this study was published in 2020, I think. He said, in response to competing defocus signals, emetropization targets the more myopic focus right? Peripheral myopic defocus can slow axial growth and produce hyperopia in monkeys, and the effects of myopic defocus on refractive development decrease with eccentricity. In other words, you want treatment strategies for myopia, which impose myopic defocus in the near periphery, not near the aura serrata, right? But in the equator. So this is all really important stuff for us to understand. So there are four lens technologies that are available. Um, I would say two of them, the first two have more um, uh, uh, follow-up, more data in terms of follow-up. But the other two are, are, I have at least one year data as well. There's DIMS, Defocus Incorporated Multiple Segments, 
HAL, highly aspheric lenslet, DOT, diffusion optics technology, and CARE, cylindrical annular refractive element. Let's go through all of them. The DIMS technology works on the concept of creating simultaneous defocus. During both distance and near viewing, one plane on the retina due to the single uh, vision zone of the lens and one plane creating myopic defocus due to the plus 3.5 diopter defocus lenses, lenslets, right? So that's how they work. Uh, this is a really nice uh, uh, picture from the LAM study. And it shows you that you've got that myopic defocus and you've got these um, segments that allow you to do that. But there's a clear zone in the middle so that the, the, the patient or the child doesn't really feel uh, that they can't see. And the images here show how the defocus occurs. So uh, there was a, this is, this data is a little bit old, but this is in an, a, a, a two year double mass randomized trial. Uh, they had 183 children and they basically showed that the average myopic progression was lower in the DIMS group. The HALT technology takes things step, a step further by introducing the concept of a volume of myopic defocus. Think about this as a shift in theory from simultaneous defocus in two planes to a three-dimensional volume of defocus in front of the retina. Now, Dr. Pradeep Sharma will tell you that thinking about volumes is much, much more accurate. But when we think about sensory fusion and we think about Panem's area, trying to explain to students about the volume of that is much harder than trying to explain a plane. But it works in volumes, right? And so here, this is, again, this is from myopiaprofile.com. This is how the uh, HAL technique works. And now you're looking at a volume, not just a plane. In reality, probably DIMS works on a volume as well, but the way the technology was uh, set out suggested that it was doing it at a plane. Again, HAL spectacle lenses, 157 children, after two years, they showed the highly aspheric or the slightly aspheric slowed myopia by 0.8 and 0.42. In other words, the highly aspheric did it much more than the slightly aspheric. What about dot lenses? Completely different. This is what I love about myopia because it's bringing in nature and nurture. Nature is our genotype. And what they showed is that basically in the L and M cone opsin gene arrays, in some individuals, because of polymorphisms, uh, in those in the uh, OPN1LW, that they actually had a high, because of this, you've got this mosaicism, I'll show you what I mean, and the mosaicism caused a really high contrast. And when you get a high contrast between neighboring um, uh, photoreceptors, that's when you get myopia. So th this is, again, a really nice study. And what the, um, what the dot... Uh, Technique, technique does is that it it blurs things slightly to reduce that contrast. And so in this study, 12-month study, again, they showed that the progression of myopia was reduced with dot technology. Now, this is the interesting thing. Dot technology could be combined with the other two that I just mentioned to you. So we could have um, a double approach. Now, the last one is new. Cylindrical annular refractive element. Now, th this is the paper from Liu et al. just published. And what they're doing is they're saying that they generate higher order aberrations to slow myopia progression. Blur signals on the retina are thought to be involved in normal eye development as it helps to regulate eye growth. That makes sense. The treatment zone in the care lenses is designed to solely create higher order aberrations in the peripheral retina to achieve a myopic control effect. And again, a one-year randomized trial showed that the lenses slowed the myopia progression um, and that the axial length progression was also slowed. So maybe it's not something you could do completely on its own, but maybe you could do it in combination. So my mother used to say, don't read too much. She was right. Don't go play outside. Your eyes will get better. She was right. And don't wear your glasses all the time. Your eyes will get weak. How did our mothers always know what was right? So these are the interventions that do work. Please do go to the uh, to the website 
And please do come to the World Congress. There's going to be two major sessions and many, many industry pharma companies are going to uh, be sponsoring the meeting with Lunchtime Symposia. Thank you very much for allowing me to do this talk, though perhaps next time uh, I get some more notice. But my thoughts are with Andrea and uh, Andreas and uh, his family. I hope everything is okay. Thank you so much, uh, Ken. Really appreciate taking this talk in just 30 minutes notice. Thank you so much. It was really wonderful. So we have uh, quite a bit of time for discussion. Uh, probably Sandra and uh, maybe Jyoti, do you have any comments? We'll begin with yeah, you. Uh, I have two yeah. questions for uh, Dr. Nishchal. Uh, one, uh, if you're talking about hyperopic defocus, are we talking with relation to the child's eye? Or once we have given him single vision glasses, it is the glasses that are inducing it. So what is yes. this? The concept the of the peripheral refraction in every child when he comes, is it a good thing or we are going to be blaming it on a single vision glasses? That's one. No, and is. second is, sorry, I'll just complete. Which will be the technology you'll advise as an optical correction in your clinic? The four choices that you've given. So, so single, it is the single vision lenses that are concave that produce hyperopic defocus, peripheral hyperopic defocus. All of, the, all of us who wear glasses, remember when I was 11, being given glasses and I suddenly could see in the distance, but every six months I would become more myopic, right? That was the classic. And then you'd end up, start at minus one, end up at minus five, minus seven, minus eight, because every six months the optometrist is giving you new glasses. So it is indeed the single vision lenses that cause the peripheral hyperopic defocus. But I think this concept of simultaneous myopic defocus to counter that is a much better way of looking at, looking at it. Um, so the, the, the answer to your question about which one, at this moment in the United States, none of these technologies are available to me, none of them. But I can tell you that the studies that have been published with the first two, purely because they came out before and they've been there longer, they're compelling. They are absolutely compelling. But I would say this, whatever you do, if you if you do it without behavioral interventions, yeah, I don't think it's going to work. You need the behavioral intervention plus. And I think in the United States, I can do atropine, so I can do atropine very easily. And as soon as the spectacle technology comes, I'm going to, when I see a child who's myopic, I'm going to prescribe whichever technology is covered by the insurance company or whichever is affordable for the family. Right now, um, I would go with the DIMS or the HAL because we don't have the data, long-term <clears throat> data for DOT or for CARE. But I'm not saying that DOT and CARE are, are less good. I'm just saying, I, looking at the data, uh, that's what I'm seeing. If we can combine DOT technology with any of the others, I think that would be great. Uh, can I ask questions to Dr. Chia? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. So, uh, two questions is you spoke about low dose atropine increasing frequency. So, do you increase that to once we give it once a day, twice a day, or anything more? And secondly, what is your regimen for tapering? So I guess there is no clear protocol of how you should taper low-dose atropine, which is something that you can follow and guide most of us. Yeah, I, I guess it was from trial and error. Okay, so so uh, the first question being is that how do I increase if I want to increase? So it depends on what doses you have available. If you have very little, then then you use what you can. So where we only had 0.01 percent, you know, if you wanted something more, we doubled it, kind of stuff, or we went to high dose atropine. So so it depends. But if you do have other doses, then it might be easier to go from one dose to the other because once a day is definitely better than twice a day in terms of compliance and and and, and sort of like you know ease for the parent to use. Um, so for for us, we went twice a day, and some parents say, "Can I use it three times a day or four times a day?" And I sort of like, "I don't know. I never really went that far because usually after that, I just increased it. Uh, oh. And now we have other doses. Uh, we can play around and go up and down as as necessary. I for tapering rather than cutting down the dose percentage, I prefer to cut down the frequency." It only because I have more control of it. I know at least what dose they're having and then I, I know how much I'm doing because sometimes if you cut down from let's say 
five oh point oh point one to oh point oh one. That that is a a tenfold reduction in the in the the the, the, the you know the the dose strength, and that might cause rebound. I don't know. So I will cut down my frequency. I usually cut down. It depends. I tell my parents. Do you want fast or slow? Because some parents are very anxious and I go slow. If some parents say, I really want to get out of it, then I go fast and if it's okay, I go, I, I stop it up a little bit faster. So I, I sometimes I feel that maybe you can just cold turkey it and it'll be okay because the studies for for ATEV2 showed that in the 0.01%, if you're after the age of 12, you stop it, the rebound was only 8%. So, so you could theoretically just stop it, but in clinical practice, if we stop it and it goes up, where do we go then? So I've just been tapering and usually sometimes you know, after you get it like, you know, just once or twice a week, the actually compliance goes down and it naturally stops in a way. And if it's fine, then then I, I go it off. So I don't think there's any hard and fast rule and 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 and, and how you do it at the moment. Yeah. I'm just too chicken too chicken to stop it like cold turkey at the moment. Uh one query, Dr. Audrey, I think you have spoken very nicely on the role of uh, low-dose atropine. Uh, does the low-dose atropine cause uh, accommodation lag to be worsening? And if children have already an accommodation lag because that is blamed to be causing more myopia, would you give bi uh, bifocals to those children? Yeah, it does cause a little bit more reduction in the accommodative uh, power. We know that uh, clinically, I don't measure accommodation lag. I, I tried to look at it, you know, and we have accommodation and how we do it, and it can be quite wearable. <laughs> so, so, so just, just, just a, a mentioned kind of stuff. One day you get one thing, and the other day you get another. So, so it's not a real measure, but we know. Yes, but with the low dose atropine, if you do get a side effect. It's more likely to be glare than than loss of near vision. So, so in. From my experience, I don't know where Pavan has any other or Ken has any, or any experience with, with that. But usually, I they get more glare than blur for low dose. Yeah, I we at, at LVP we started to see patients complaining of pro ache at times, and very few of them complained that uh, in the morning I'm not able to read. Very specific. You know, they got the drop in the night. They say that okay, since few days in the morning I have a hobby of reading in the morning. And I'm not able to do that. Uh, uh, but lag, yes, very minimal. But, you know, out of hundreds of patients that we've got, not everybody is in that zone. Only very few, but they still complain. Yeah. So in our ATOM 2 study, you know, when we restarted all the children 0.01% later, the first uh, the first run we said, do you want it? And about 7% of children with the low dose wanted something. Okay. Mm -hmm. And on the second phase where, where they restarted, none of the children thought they required either the progressive or the tint. Uh, mm -hmm. it, oh, and in that in that case, um, the the for the ATOM 1 study, there were some children that were placebo that thought they needed it. So, so go figure. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for uh, Dr. Audrey. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. And uh, 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 the uh, difference, I think, between the Singapore study and India is that we do not have multiple uh, percentages of atropine available with us. So when we start with uh, 0 0.01, which is the only one available, if that doesn't work, then there are not many options. Mm. I uh, The BD dose may not work as equally as a higher percentage of uh, atropine. There's no mm. studies proving it that way. So uh, my question is, mm, in the Indian scenario, which age group would you think that 0 0.01 would be most effective to start as a solo therapy, as a single therapy? And in a younger age group, would it be better to start on some other intervention and use atropine as a uh, combination therapy in considering that we have only one percentage available? Yeah, I, I think a good question. But I think, okay, two things. Firstly, um, usually for us, because when, when we looked at the result, we did an audit of our 0.01%. And the children who are nine years and above, quite a number of them did okay just on 0.01%. So so you could start on that. And sometimes when, when the parents are a bit nervous and say, I don't know, I know what, what dose to start, we can start with the low dose first and then, okay, if you're comfortable, then we can go to a higher dose. So sometimes you can do that to just ease them into to using the drug and say, I'm afraid of side effects or whatever. Then you can do that. Um, but um, normally for us, as I said, we, we have the same problem. The children are the nine 
sometimes nothing works well. Okay, so 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 it's the one that yes, they don't go to they don't work so well with atrophin, but they also don't work well with the as well with the glasses or 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 the contacts. The studies show that. So younger children just harder. You have to just throw everything. Uh, Pavan, uh, Ken, would you agree? Yeah, I so so I think that uh, there are non-responders that are non-responders because of their genotype, and I think that at this moment in time, uh, I can I can reveal that at Pittsburgh we're trying to put together a panel for my a quick myopia screen to see if a patient will be a responder or non-responder. And um, I can't tell you which gene we're looking at at the moment because I'm not allowed to do that. But it, but there there is there there are a couple of biomarkers that. Um, we're hoping that we can make a cheap test, like you know, hundred dollars to to one hundred and fifty dollars. So I think I think that's important to to know that the genotype has an effect. Um, I do think that one of the things that uh, working in the WSPOS becomes very apparent is that sometimes we have a discussion, but we are not comparing apple. We're comparing apples to oranges, and I'll give you an example why. In Singapore and in Taiwan, in the late 1990s, the ministries of health instituted public health um, uh, maneuvers to, in, uh, to give behavioral interventions in schools because they recognized that myopia was an issue. And I, you know, those papers are there. If you look in the, in the governmental papers, they, in Taiwan, they said, encourage distance, this is in 1998, encourage distance gazing, encourage playing outside, the, uh, um, change the height of the desks, uh, change the lighting in the rooms. In Singapore, they started to build, build schools that had clear walls. So when we, when we sit and compare, does 0 0.05 better than 0 0.01? We don't understand the background of the behavioral interventions that have already been done at a public health level in Taiwan and Singapore. I personally have never found that I needed 0 0.05. So I'm confused by the LAMP study. And unfortunately, we don't have anybody from the LAMP study on the thing, even though they were invited. So because my question would be, did Hong Kong instigate the behavioral interventions that Singapore and Taiwan did? Because if they didn't, then you're not comparing the treatment appropriately. So for me, the study that came out of the United States that says 0 0.01 doesn't work, they had no behavioral interventions whatsoever, none. So I'm saying very categorically, if you don't want to do behavioral interventions, don't do any treatment because it's not going to work. It's absolutely not going to work. Yes. No, I don't know. I mean, I think different populations are different. If you look at the all those different studies and you look at the the placebo group and look at how much they progress there are differences and, and sometimes there are formulation differences and stuff like that so usually when i when i sort of like say you know how does it work in your population you have to experiment yourself and and see how your your population reacts um in the past i think pavan when i was first 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 like i met when we went and, and and had the talk you know the cases that you're presenting all the kids were like you know, 10, 11 years old onset of myopia. You, and now I, I hear that they're getting down to, to six and seven. So again, the, the shift has happened in India where you're getting a lot of young children now having early onset myopia and therefore the problem of what to do with that because you need something more aggressive perhaps in the younger children. I think intervention is is good, but I don't really know whether Singapore succeeded very much. So, and and the, 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 the effect of intervention once your myopia fit is there but it's not that strong too but we all say it because i've seen children suddenly get worse and on on treatment stable for a long time and get worse so we don't want that to happen so we say uh, do your good good eye habits and stuff like that and, and things yeah so audrey i agree that different oh, sorry go ahead go, go ahead uh, ken after yeah. that I, I, was, have... I agree different populations do respond differently that goes back to my point about the genotype but I think sometimes you, even though you're saying that the public health um, interventions may may not have been horribly or terribly successful, at least you have them, right? When you start to compare the intervention of atropine, low dose atropine, in a population where there's no public health, none, to one where there is, 
I'm saying that there's a difference that we're not taking into account and that we need to take that into account if we're going to compare how low-dose atropine or these spectacles or the contact lenses work. That, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, uh -huh. there is one practical question to all the panelists and speakers. A child's age is uh, four years and the child has a myopia of uh, minus three axial there are no other involvement other than behavioral therapy what additional things you all begin in this particular patient and one of the parent is myopic of minus four diopters so this is something uh, for everybody what is your first line of therapy in this particular situation we'll so start what with about the, the progression there's only a one uh, data you're giving. One, one, one. Yeah. one. So there is no record of uh, progression. I mean, what was no. earlier? No. Okay. No. So I Age would see after six months, uh, if there is any progression of more than 0.5, then only I would institute a therapy. My statement is similar to what Dr. Sharma said. So I would wait and watch four to six months, map the actual and ensure uh, it's correlating with the approximate refractive error that we are seeing at that visit. Six months' time, if there's a change, yes. And my first preference is always on the optical strategy, given that in one shot, you are hitting two births. You anyway have to prescribe something for the child to see things. So in the same shot, if you can get correct uh, control as well, then it's deal done. But first, lifestyle modification or understand that there is nothing and then see if the child is you know, doing a lot of near work or watch their behavior. And like Dr. Ken Nishal indicated, change the lifestyle, see if it works. Six so months. Both of you say that look for progression. And then if there is progression, optical is the preferred mode of uh, uh, preventive study. Any no, other? My, uh, my first choice yeah. wouldn't be optical. I mean, my first choice would be, I think, low-dose atropine uh, mm -hmm. because of the maybe economics because the cost of the spectacles is more. And for a small child, putting those uh, lenses, I mean, they may be easily lost or scratched or destroyed. I mean, I would be a little more keen for low-dose atropine as the first choice. Sure. Um, Can I, I agree and Jyoti? Yeah. I, I, I sort of like agree in the sense that uh, I'll probably go low-dose atropine or high-low-dose atropine huh. in my case. Yeah. Um, be because this, at the moment, the glasses, the evidence for that age group, three years old, is it's not it's not sort of like it. Well, I mean, there's no evidence for atropine either, but it, at least there's no evidence with the glasses. And 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 usually at that age, three year old, you know, minus three, you know, sometimes they don't want to wear glasses, and, and you might have a hard time getting glasses on. So we sometimes with that group. Um, I'm not sure what the experience are in India, but sometimes with the glasses, because sometimes like they come with the glasses and they're still progressing. So we just need to know that all treatments have a potential failure rate. So so uh, yeah. nothing is nothing is hundred percent in this world, and and you just have to try and see how it goes. Yeah. Any other opinion? Yes, sir. I would like so, to. Uh, Ramesh. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Sandra. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to know first whether the child is born preterm. What was the birth weight of the kid? Normal, first, normal. Everything normal. is normal delivery and everything, full term baby, all that. Okay. So the thing is here, we need to make a distinction whether it is a simple myopia or it is born with minus three, you know, because then there will be a vast difference. If the child is born with minus three, the interventions may be totally different. We don't know whether it, the, usually the kids who are born with myopia, they don't progress as much. Whereas if it is a simple school age myopia, definitely it is the child may progress. So if I look at like a minus 0.5 at the age of five or six, I think I would consider that as a progressive myopia because 90% of those children definitely progress with time. It is very rare that the child will continue to stay at minus 0 0.05. Whereas if I see a minus 3 at the age of 3, I think I would wait for 6 months to look for a progression to make sure that, you know, this is a progressive myopia and then go forth. But my choice of intervention would be glasses first. Um, <laughs> because uh, I feel that uh, the my if I start with atropine, the 0 0.01, it has to be continued at least for 10 years. And we do not know whether the effect of the drop is the same uh, over such a long period of time and whether they'll 
there can be some kind of tachyphylaxis with the receptors or so when you continue to there is no studies like beyond the two years uh, we don't know whether the effect is the same as before so those are my concerns there okay uh, jyoti and ken and then we should uh, finish i think yeah yeah, so I think everybody is talking the same thing. Yes, we would not give uh, any treatment option in the first visit. Wait for a progression. We would do six monthly, check with the actual length, not only the refraction change, but an actual length growth change also. What I tend to do is I also do the peripheral progression. Then I feel that they can worsen with the existing glasses. And then I give the option of glasses as well as atropine. That would be my first option. If I find there is no hyperopic B focus on that, then atropin would be my first choice. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I th pretty much the same. I mean, if the if it's so, I would say four year old with minus three with a one member of a family who has myopia, you know, parent. Um, I would instigate behavioral intervention, see them in six months. If the growth was more than um, was up to five, you know, between point. Point up to point minus point five, then or more, then I would start treatment. In the US, I have no option. It would have to be uh, low dose atropine. But uh, it, when the spectacle lenses become uh, available, that would be something that I, I, I would consider. I have had a five year old pitch up, very similar, and the mother wanted me to give him orthokeratology because she was of uh, Chinese origin and she had orthokeratology when she was young. And so she asked for orthokeratol. I was very nervous. And I sent him to my optometrist. And he was like, yeah, we could do this. This kid's five-year-old. He's very sensible. We can do this. So it's not something I jumped to. But um, yeah, so you have options. But only thing, Ramesh, that at every visit, we have to keep on asking questions about near activity outdoor. Because the one question asked at the first visit this doesn't help. Because many times yeah. when I ask them, they said, yeah, no, but we followed okay. the first month, but now we are not following again. And also, I think reading, there are a lot of children into voracious readings about the competitive exams in India. That's very common that you will understand the parents are really making them study so much. So that background also we need to get it. So we know what actually is the so that the behavioral changes can be, re uh, you know, reinforced. I yeah. have a question. Many times to... uh, they think that uh, you know you, you give atropine or optical correction. They think that will take care of everything, and behavior is really not required. So that's very important. I think we have to conclude here because of the time factor. We learned about the epidemiology. We learned about various aspects of myopia progression control, along with behavioral therapy. And Pawan alluded to some of the newer innovations. And ultimately, I think the, the customized treatment, depending upon where you live, where the patients are from, what is the profile of patients, these are important when you really treat these patients. With that note, I would like to uh, conclude. I have uh, two, three slides to share uh, with everyone, thanking everyone. Uh, the first one is, uh, this is the first webinar of WSPOS. We have second, third, and fourth in this uh, season. First one will be in uh, February. Uh, cystinosis is the topic, and followed by a third webinar in uh, March, which will fo focus on imaging. And the last one, with the, uh, along with the International Orthoptics Association, we'll have a webinar on focusing uh, related issues, especially accommodation related uh, disorders. As Ken said, uh, all are welcome for the this exciting fifth World Congress of Pediatric Ophthalmology and uh, Strabismus, which is going to be in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. For all the Indians, there are no visas required from February 1st, so that's very easy. And uh, it's between 11th to 13th of uh, July. We would like every one of uh, you to submit an uh, abstract, which uh, you have more than a month now. Fourth March is the last date for submitting, and we have fantastic keynote speakers and other speakers for this uh, World Congress. And we have more than 76 sessions each day, more than 25 sessions. This is on day one, this is on day two, this is on day three. So more than 75 sessions on pediatric ophthalmology you get to hear. 
And uh, we also request every one of you to join uh, WSPOS as a member. It's completely free with lots and lots of benefits. And last but not the least, I would like to thank all our audience today and also the fantastic uh, expert panel and our speakers. Special thanks to Ken to deliver this talk in 30 minutes notes, uh, notice and also to Padmaja to stay awake uh, till uh, you know 1 a.m. in the morning. And we'd like to thank the AIOS for this collaboration and of course, uh, all the team members of uh, WSPOS. Thank you so much, every one of you and have a fantastic uh, day or night ahead. Thank you so much and namaste. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. It was a wonderful session. Thank you, Shubha. Thank you. Bye.